my name is Will Carlson. I am one of the chief mentors here on the platform. For those of you that don't know that already, um, I kind of came up through the ranks here at Cybrary and, and really just jumped in and, and took on whatever role I could. Uh, and they, they haven't kicked me out yet. So I suppose that's a good thing. Um, I found my way here uh, looking to get my CISSP certification uh, a couple of years ago now um, and just you know, loved the content and then got into the community and really loved the community and, and all that they're doing and, and how different that is from anywhere else in any other online resource that I had found. And coming from a world of small to medium business, uh, I don't have a whole lot of peers in that space, right? So at my office, I'm, I'm a team of two uh, and we manage all IT and cyber for uh, the highest point, 10 locations and 115 employees. So uh, it was great to have a community here to reach out to and ask questions and get opinions. Um, so the community has been really indispensable for me uh, all along the way. Um, so just a little bit more background. Um, I have a number of cybersecurity certifications. I've been in IT and cyber for probably 15 plus years altogether in various roles. Um, and I am the IT and cybersecurity director for a medium financial services company uh, here in Texas. Uh, so, so my name is Mark. I've been a chief mentor with Cybrary, uh, just hit over two years now. So it, it was a pretty unique opportunity for me. It was one of the emails that I received about looking for a mentor. And, you know, I, I follow an old Jim Carrey quote, you got to take risks in life. So uh, I just kind of threw myself out there and offered myself to be a mentor. And that's kind of how I jumped on board with Cybrary. And the reason for me has always been, I enjoy helping people. That, that's one of the things that I do here. It's one of the things I do at my current job. And, and it's just a fantastic way to give back with the ultimate goal of helping people avoid all of the mistakes that I've made. I do think that failing and making mistakes is a part of the journey, uh, but we can maybe minimize those a little bit to make it not so difficult. I started, I mean, I originally found Cybrary uh, I can still remember it. I still worked in Columbus when I just first started with the government. And somebody said I had to get my security plus. And uh, at that point, you know, I had a master's in computer science. I didn't know what a certification was because I just, that didn't exist. I, I didn't know. So this would have been in probably 2012. And so I was like, well, how do I study for this stuff? And somebody put, put me on Cybrary. And that's really how I started. And I always poked around. Uh, so, so when I got the email about mentoring, you know, I just moved out here to Bahrain. Uh, so I guess that's another piece of my story too, right? Is I work for the Department of Defense. And I'm deployed out here in Bahrain in the Middle East. That's why you'll see when I say 110, uh, that's the real temperature. And we haven't really started yet. We're just kind of cranking up out here. But, you know, being out here, I've also got to envision and see some other cultures and how they do cybersecurity and how they do, you know, just IT in general. So, you know, coming on here with interview techniques, it's been a long time since I've interviewed in person, but I've done that. And the reason that Will and I decided to kind of put this call together was because we've jumped on several of our live session calls before, and we have a, a similar kind of approach with how they work. And we've heard lots of great feedback. So we thought that we'd kind of put more of an official uh, meeting together and brief with everybody and kind of see how it goes. Hopefully it's helpful. And uh, we both have the chat up, so if you have questions, just type away, and we will try to answer them as we go through. Uh, I'm okay at multitasking most of the time, but it's 11.07 p.m. out here, so uh, I can't promise anything. I'll give you my best. That's great. So, Mark, I guess the, the first part on the agenda then is, uh, so resumes. Should you pay to have yours redone? Does it really matter? What are the hard, fast rules? Are there any? Can Cybrary help with that? Yeah, so I mean, the, the way that I look at it as, you know, Cyber has great resources. Now that you're Insider Pro, you have the career planning channel that we have lots of people that help review resumes. Uh, just to give an example for me, um, I found someone who does resumes and she specializes in federal government, military, DOD. And I can tell you that prior to uh, the new job that I was just offered, you know, I've had a USA Jobs profile for a long, long time. And I would, I have probably applied for 50 or 60 jobs, never got referred. I paid for a professional to do a resume because I've realized that that is definitely not what I'm good at. And I would say about 95% of all the jobs I've applied for, I've been referred to. 
and I've probably turned down more jobs and interviews in my life in the last six months than I ever have even interviewed for in the past. So, you know, the benefit with cyber is you may not necessarily have to pay for a resume. We have the people that can help you do that. Will, I'm sure you can agree on that with what you've seen. I know you're a great person to review resumes. Yeah, I mean, I think so something that's interesting to me is the, you know, I, I'm very similar to you, Mark. Most of the jobs, really all the jobs I've had up to this point have been uh, referrals or somebody knew me uh, or from a friend of a friend or a network or uh, something that helped me get in the door. Um, ultimately, you had to have a resume, but that wasn't the sole provider of setting up the initial interview, which is really where I think resumes fit into the picture, right? So, and it's so much different now as well uh, with applicant tracking systems. You'll hear them referred to as ATS systems. Um, some of you on the call may not even realize what that is. If you haven't heard that before, um, I'd encourage you to look it up. I mean, it's essentially uh, a Google for your resume, right? So your resume gets crawled by this bot that identifies key phrases that the employer is looking for. And in a lot of large organizations, if you put it into context, you know, how many hundreds of applications might they get for a job? And if they kick your resume out, but they ultimately place the position, they really don't care. Um, so your resume has to kind of serve double duty these days. You've got to have the keywords intentionally put in there. You've got to have your experience laid out in a way, preferably with metrics that matter, right? Not just did this one thing, but um, uh, for example, led security awareness training and took our fish rates down by 50%. Um, that's a good resume bullet, but you have to do all those things in addition to making it through um, the ATS system as well. So resumes can be a real challenge. Uh, definitely resources here on Cyberary to help out. Um, but I, I think it's beneficial also to really seriously consider paying a professional uh, to help you work on your resume. I know I have in the past and I feel like it really helped. Uh, if nothing else, they ask questions and frame your experience in a way, at least for myself, that I never would have. So they help me pull things out of my experience and present them in a a more meaningful way. Yeah, I mean, the lady that I used made me cry when she <laughs> sent my resume back for review. Uh, but Mike, to answer your question, I, I think it depends on the company. So I know with USA Jobs, in order for you to get even considered for an interview, you have to beat the filter. If you don't beat the filter, you don't even ever get in front of a person uh, to even have a chance at an interview. And that, that's the stuff that I've learned over the years. And that's kind of why even on cyber, if you're looking for like a government job with the U.S., that's why I try to help everybody out because that's one of the things that I know a lot about. We have different acronyms. We have different skill sets. And I assume that this is applicable across any company anywhere. If you can get some insider information on the buzzwords and the keywords that they use or what they're looking for, it helps. Uh, the bad part with the government is that you almost have to copy and paste what they're looking for in the job to beat the system in order to get a, to get a, an interview. But, you know, you, you kind of have to just weigh the pros and cons, right? Yeah, you got to pay for a resume, but if this leads into you getting your dream job, I mean, ultimately, I think it's absolutely worth it. And you can try Cyberry. We can do what we can to help you review and get you, get you where we can, uh, it, or even provide referrals to great people that can, you can pay to help do it. I don't get any kickbacks, but I refer the lady I use plenty of times and uh, I, I'm being dead serious when she almost made me cry. She pretty much circled my whole resume and sent it back. So, and then I answered all the questions and, and, you know, first job I applied for, it took a while, but I got the, I got the interview and we'll kind of touch on that as we go through tonight. Yeah. And the other thing I'll say too here on, on the topic of, of interviews is um, one of our other fellow mentors that's actually on the call right now, um, a friend of mine, Mike Ma, uh, I think he he always impresses me because he does a stellar job of keeping a log and a tally of all of the projects and experiences that he's had as he's worked any of the jobs. So when it comes time to prepare a resume, Mike's not digging back through his mental Rolodex thinking, man, what did I do? What was I involved with? Uh, because in the moment, that's often the hardest time to do that. So I definitely encourage you to keep a register uh, in a, a Google Doc or you know anywhere. There's plenty of places to do that, but just of all the projects you've been involved in uh, and the things that, you know, should you need to brush up your resume, they'll be there when you're ready to do that. Because 
if you hire somebody to do your resume, that's the kind of information they're going to be looking for. So uh, keep that register so you're not flat footed when or if you need that information. Yeah, I mean, even to add on to that, if you have to do your, so with my job, I have to do an annual review, but I also have to do a mid-year review. I have to provide input to that. So keeping track of your projects is also a great way for you to make sure that your boss knows how awesome that you are. Because if you can't put it in writing, there's nothing really stating that you're as good as you are. And I learned the first couple of years that by not keeping track of things really doesn't help you. So it benefits in many ways. Uh, so, so, you know, you can kind of see the importance of why having a good resume is out there because that's kind of your foot in the door. You know, you can't get upset with not getting interviews if you didn't put in enough effort making the resume, you know, what it needs to be in order to get out there. So, you know, you, you got to kind of present yourself in the way that you want people to see you. If it's a resume that you put a little bit of effort in, uh, people like, you know, Will and I, we see lots of resumes. We see a lot of things come through. It's easy to spot the people that have put just, to, you know, whatever it takes to get one in there to apply for a job. Uh, I mean, it, it's just, it's just the truth. And really good resumes are impressive. And, you know, there's also the downside of that, right, is now you get the interview and you're like, oh, so this person made up a lot of things. So still be truthful on your resume. Um, you know, it, there are, there is a bad side to it. Well, I'm sure you, you've seen that plenty of times. Oh, I, I definitely had a candidate for a job that I thought was phenomenal. I mean, resume was amazing. He'd basically done everything to the point that it didn't make me totally suspicious, but it was like, wow, look at all this stuff. And I, I you know, I ran him through a, the interview and then we did a, a, an a, a adaptive test assessment and it took him a while and I got an alert that he was done and I walked down the hallway to see how he did. And he was like, <laughs> you won't be hearing from me again. And he just walked out. I was so confused, Mark. And he bombed it. Um, so either he was a horrible test taker, which could be it, but right. I'm more inclined to believe that he was fluffing his resume by a wide margin. Uh, so yeah, definitely don't do that. Um, I have a question here in chat, Mark, too, that's, um, yeah. that asks kind of specifically if, if for those that may be changing careers uh, in specific to the resume, um, how much non-security experience should somebody list in that situation? And I'll jump on real quickly and just say, I think as with so many things resume, it really depends on the role that you're going for. Uh, because the point of the resume, you're better off if your resume fits the role. Uh, I know a lot of people like to just have a, a boilerplate resume because I'm in cyber and I'm looking for a cyber role and they send that one all the time. Um, I know for myself, uh, because I have touched a number of things over my career and still currently do, I've got a few different versions of my resume that kind of tick major boxes, like a, a strategic version or a hands-on engineer type version. Uh, and I'll send a different one based on the role. So I think you have to tailor your resume for the role that you want. But as far as uh, non-security experience, it's still put on your resume what fits that role. There are a bunch of cyber jobs that are not strictly technical. Uh, and you can leverage a lot of different skill sets. Uh, but none of that really matters if it's not skills that the particular job you're applying for is looking for. Yeah, and I mean, you know, with the resume, you, you, you want to be truthful. And, and if you really think about a lot of things that you do, you have way more of a cybersecurity mindset than you think. So, so there are definitely ways to wordsmith things, not to fit, but to kind of correlate with what you're learning here on cyber, what you've done in school. To, to match kind of what a job is. If it's an entry level job, I mean, they're not expecting you to have a whole lot of experience. That's why it's an entry level job. So just be honest. And, and then, you know, one of the things as you're preparing your resume, when you answer questions, think about all, all of the things that you've done that you can kind of help aim towards, you know, like security experience. Uh, but, you know, when it comes to, to the government, they uh, and, and I'm sure this is a lot of other people, a lot of other jobs they post out there, right? They're, they're identifying the ideal candidate, the perfect person that probably doesn't exist for what salary they're willing to pay for. So, you know, put together a resume and, and it, it's, it again goes into effort, right? So put the time in to customize your resume for the job you're applying for and it pays off in the end. If you have a generic resume and you shotgun blast it out, you, you may get a hit, but it may not be the hit you're looking for. So when you find that job that you really want to aim for, in my mind, it's always worth putting in the extra time up front just to get, to make sure that, you know, you're not looked past. I mean, do you put the effort in. 
but that, that's kind of one of the things that I kind of always harp on is if you gave it 110% and you didn't get the interview, I mean, at least, you know, you put it all in there, but if you didn't get the interview and you put 75% in, I mean, you can only be disappointed with yourself and then you kind of live in that regret space. So just do it up front and, and fix it and get it in there. Um, yeah. So I Evelyn, when it comes, yeah, so sorry, Evelyn, when it comes to LinkedIn, Based on what I do, I don't, I'm on LinkedIn, but I don't really know how it works resume wise because I can't put a lot of stuff on there. I don't know if Will, if that's something you know a little bit more about or could touch on. Yeah. I mean, the, the, I think the best advice that I got that resonated with me in regards to LinkedIn and blogs and those things is that, uh, first of all, you don't have to have them, but when you're trying to stand out from a sea of other candidates, it, well, I guess it could hurt depending on the nature of your social media profiles. But if, if I'm an employer and I'm looking at you as a candidate for a job, really the part of the interview, the point of the interview, and we'll get to this, I think, uh, for sure, is to get to know you and to see whether or not you're going to be able to do the job that I'm filling and the quality of your fit with the team. So anything that I can get my hands on to help me more efficiently get to know you better, uh, is really good. Now, does that mean it's necessarily going to help you land the job? Not always. In fact, it may not. Uh, the employer may decide that based on your social media profile, you're not the best fit. But well, I'll talk more about best fit in the interview process as we go. But um, I, I think in our current market, if you don't do those things, you should probably have a pretty good reason that you're not on those places, uh, that you're not blogging, that you're not uh, publicly in, in the social media space. Uh, because it's, it's becoming more and more and more standard. Um, as far as LinkedIn goes specifically, um, the, the advice that I heard that I, that I really liked was that my resume that I turn in for the job interview is a page, maybe two, uh, three possibly, if you're pushing a senior role. I mean, if you're in the government market, it's going to be like 10 pages. But um, your LinkedIn profile is a place for you to really catalog all the things that you've done. That's where you can put all the details. So if you've gotten interest based on your resume, let them go to your LinkedIn profile and get more. So you, you don't, you're not space constrained on LinkedIn. So if it's relevant, put it all there. Um, that's the place to really show it all, I think. Yeah, I mean, a good employer is going to do the research on you. I mean, I look up people that I just chat with. So I would definitely do that if I was looking for somebody to hire. Uh, so, so, you know, now, now we're at the point to, uh, and Mike, uh, we'll touch on the soft skills as we go through this. So I, I saw your question in there. So now it's, you know, you got the resume, you made it through the filter, uh, you know, fireworks have went off. You got that email, hands go up in the air. You scream to your wife to say, come look at this. I got an interview request for this awesome, amazing job. I say that because that's exactly what happened when I got the interview request for the, the new job that I have in the UK. Uh, I remember running and screaming up the hallway that we get to leave the desert and it's not a thousand degrees anymore. Uh, and just to put that in perspective, so I mean, you know, you've got the request for an interview and for me, uh, it's still within the same organization. So I've got the interview request. The first thing that comes in my mind is okay, I see the job in the listing. It tells me what command, what the organization is. So the first thing that I do is I go find that organization's page and I start looking up people. I start looking up what they do and I start preparing myself just to compare the skills that I know that I have, the things that I've done within the government, within the organization I work for and what this new job does so that I know what questions they're going to ask me before they know what they're going to ask me because you know, I need to be ready. And, you know, with, with my job, it's, I do an interview, God, I mean, maybe once every three years. So it's not like I have a whole lot of practice with it. Uh, luckily with cyber, I get to do a lot more practice. I get to talk to everybody through all these platforms, which has helped out tremendously. But uh, that, that's how I prepare. You know, I really go into the open source intelligence and I really start digging in and finding as many things as I can. And if I know somebody that works in this group or has worked in that group or knows somebody who knows somebody, I'm asking questions on, hey, what's this guy like? What do I need to do? Uh, so you know, that, that's my approach. Yeah, I mean, I'll say, um, too, I think um, it's tough right now, right? So there's a lot going on in the world. There are, unfortunately, a lot of people out of work, even in the cyberspace. Uh, I think we've been sheltered from it a little bit, but we've... Um, 
definitely still felt it. Uh, even seeing a lot of cyber professionals getting repurposed and moved over to IT to help enable uh, organizations to continue to operate. So uh, really an interesting space right now. A lot of people just looking for work. Um, but I, I want to approach that from a just looking for work oftentimes leads to a temporary assignment at best. Um, so if you're really looking for a career place to land, you, you got to remember that going into the interview, it's as much about you interviewing the employer as it is them interviewing you. It should really be a two-way conversation. And I know as somebody that sat in the seat of the employer interviewing candidates, I can't impress enough on, on the group uh, how great it is to have people that come in with their own questions that have already know a little bit about the organization. And if, if that reads as they're excited to work at your organization, that's even better. So absolutely do your research on the organization um, and try to determine if that's really not somewhere you personally are a good fit for. Um, and you know, even if you're not, if you're in an unfortunate situation where you're just looking for a paycheck, um, do yourself a favor and still do that work um, and let them know that you are anxious to work at their organization because it will likely even still set you apart from a number of the other candidates. So you, you gotta do your research. Once you've got that, that uh, once you get that, hey, we wanna bring you in for an interview, do your research. So Serenity, I see your question in there about um, changing jobs too often. Uh, the, the things that I look at is if each job is kind of increasing experience, I don't see it as a huge deal. It also depends on kind of what the time frame is. Is it three months, six months, nine months? Uh, just expect to answer the question, hey, I noticed you kind of changed jobs. What's, what's going on? And in, in my mind, if you can justify to me, you know, I did this for this long and then I found this job to get this experience. Um, I wouldn't harp on it. I know it's kind of different than uh, it used to be out there, depending on where you kind of come and go. That That's kind of, it's a situational thing. If you can word it correctly on an interview, I don't see it being a problem. If you kind of stumble and you can't really provide a good answer, then to me it might seem like, oh, they maybe they got fired or they got laid off or, uh, hey, I'm going to check that box. I'm going to call these employers where normally I wouldn't because it wouldn't matter. And then, so how do you put work experience in an entry level job? Uh, so, I mean, all of us have been there, right? I mean, I, I finished, I, I know one of my most frustrating things during my bachelor's and my master's both was that I went to the career development group or the career group thinking, oh my gosh, when I, when they sold me to pay this money for the school, I'm going to come out, I'm going to make a ton of money and these people are going to be really awesome. And I was super disappointed because I've got non-technical people trying to place me in jobs that they don't really even know what they're doing. They're just pushing me through to meet their numbers. So I, I think the biggest thing is, is use the skills that you learn on cyber that you use through, you know, even a degree program or things that you've learned on your own. And anything you put on the resume that you can truthfully an answer questions to, uh, you're fine. If you put on there that, hey, I'm a C++ programmer and I ask you a question about it and you meet what I ask, I could care less whether you did it on a job or not. You, you met the technical requirements. Uh, so, I mean, that, that, that's just kind of the things to look for. And then the last one is how do you handle being out of work for a period of time with job experience? Uh, do you need to have something there to fill a time gap for you? I mean, what, what, everybody has a reason, right? I mean, if you're, I mean, whether it's family, work, military, even, you know, if you're independently wealthy or wh whatever the reason is, I don't think it matters. I mean, it, it's a different workscape now, right? Uh, you know, I know when you go for a clearance, you have to fill in like, what would you do for a year? Why'd you not work? But uh, it, it's a different landscape. I, I don't think that's a huge deal. I mean, I may ask you, but other than, I mean, again, if you're truthful and I can tell that you're not trying to like fib to me, well, I don't know if you're the same way, but I mean, if you're honest, I mean, it, it is what it is. We've all been there. I mean, I've been all over the place. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think for me, um, I can see it going both ways, right? So some people, there's, there's a bit of a debate as to whether or not you try to cover that on the resume or whether you just leave it a blank or I don't necessarily think there's a right answer there. It's just going to depend on the HR person looking at your resume. But I think if you do have gaps in your experience, you should absolutely be prepared to uh, answer questions about them in the interview because an interviewer is going to ask what that is. And, you know, I, 
I, I think the answer can be anything. Uh, as long as it's not, you know, it wouldn't be great if the answer was, you know, I took a year off because I was tired of working. Um, that's not going to be so great. That's not what a prospective <laughs> employer really wants to hear. So as long as you can explain it better than that, um, yeah. I, I think you're fine. Um, I, I think it's also a bit more challenging if your gap in work is extended and recent, right? So if you're coming off of a current gap in work for a year, why? Um, you know, yeah. you can't change it though. I mean, it is what it is. So I think personally, uh, you just have to go in there and own it um, and, and be as, as straightforward as you can with why that's that way and, you know, what you did to try to, uh, to, to not have that gap or, or explain why you did have that gap. Um, Mark, I'll yeah. go on to here and ask about uh, um, most cyber jobs here asking for two or three years of experience. Um, they do. I get it. I, I definitely see it. Uh, it's, again, it's interesting right now because I think there's a fair number of people that are looking for work. So I think right now the number of jobs is shrunk a little bit and the competition for them right now is going to be a little bit stiff. That's my personal opinion. Um, but I will say that just because an employer is asking for two to three years experience, they may be nine months into that job listing and they really at this point just need a warm body. Um, so apply, just apply. The worst yep. that's going to happen is you're going to get a really speedy, sorry, not at this time. Yep. Well, we've talked about it before. Every job I've ever had that I've ever been offered and, and received, I never met every single qualification that was out there. Just to give you an idea, I run a network operations center here in the Middle East. I've never worked in network operations. I've never been a network engineer. I saw the job, I said, you know what, I could absolutely do that. I came out here, I owned it, and I would like to think that I'm a rock star just because that's just who I am. But if you read through a job description and you honestly think that you can do it, then apply for it. And when you get the interview, own it. Be the, be the guy that they're looking for. If they ask you a question that you can't answer, you know, I, I, I'm not really sure what you're asking me, but let, let, this is how I would approach finding that answer. And this is what I would do, the steps I would take to, to fix that problem, you know, blah, blah, blah. Or if you're like, if you're going into a management role or supervisory role, uh, you know, one of the questions I've been asked is, hey, you're coming into a role that you've never experienced before. How would you approach uh, being the team leader? And some simple answers are, you know, hey, I would sit with the team. I would sit with each person and I would ask them, what do you do? Show me what you do day in, day out. What are your number one complaints? What do you like about the job? What do you not like about the job? And then as you go through the team, you learn all of the ins and outs and the exactly, you know, what a job entails. And this is more from the management side, but in my mind, you can't be a good manager, leader, supervisor, if you don't understand what your people do for you. But with what Will said, this is kind of what the conversation that him and I have had most of the time is if I've got the interview, I have the job, I just have, you just need to be convinced me, number one, that I need to take it. And we need to have a conversation that goes both ways for us both to agree that this is a good fit for both sides. I mean, if you've got the interview, then you've impressed somebody because with, with the government, most of the time in order to get an interview, you're the top five, top 10. So think of all the people that have applied where you're already at and be confident because you've made it. And yeah, you know, I, now I, you're, now you're at the all-star league and convince people. Yeah, I mean, I, I think at that point, right, you're exactly right, Mark. I mean, they've already called through resumes. Chances are you may have already had a very quick HR screening call just to make sure that you're an okay fit and that there's no immediate fluff or disqualifiers. Um, so by the time you get that real first res that first interview, um, they're interested. And then it's about, uh, is this candidate going to be a good fit for the team? Are they going to be a good fit for the role? Uh, what value do they offer? Are they going to justify their pay? I mean, there's a whole series of additional questions the employer has in their mind and really is the, the candidate. It's, it's all about showing your value to them. And Mark, I know we talk about this all the time. It, it usually ends up being roped in with cert certifications and or master's degree programs. And those things might get you past the initial screening but they are not going to get you the job. If you cannot communicate your value and your knowledge and mastery of the skills that the employer needs, you're going to continue to be searching for work. Um, and I think, uh, analyze Mike, to your point there, that, that goes to soft skills as well, right? So you can have somebody that's amazingly technically proficient, but if they clam up hard in a technical interview, 
their resume is going to have to be so much better and their experience so much more outstanding to get past that interview. Or they're going to have to find that, you know, that really great employer that's willing to dig past the discomfort at a human level uh, to, to get information out of that candidate. So those soft skills. Three letter agencies. <laughs> Yeah, right. That, yeah, that's exactly right. Somebody that knows who they need and is okay with that. But those soft skills are invaluable. And I think, you know, it's like anything else. You know, if you want to be a marathon runner, you don't just pick up in the Bahrain heat and go decide to run a marathon. You know, you, you, you train, you start and you just get going and you practice and you practice regularly and you can practice interview techniques here. You can record yourself with your smartphone, which people don't like to do. Um, you can you know, have an interview or answer technical scenario type questions to yourself in the mirror in your bathroom. Um, anything you can do to practice those soft skills and communicating what you know uh, will go a huge way uh, for an interview. Yeah, I mean, and, and it, the downside of that is if you put on your resume that you have excellent communication skills and speaking skills and briefing skills and you've done all of these great things, yet you get on an interview and you can't speak, they're going to question it. But with, with cyber, I, I know that Will and I have both done it. There's lots of other assistant mentors that have done it. If you're nervous, ask. And we can throw together a mock interview, even just ask you the basic questions, just so you can kind of practice, uh, you, you know, your 30-second elevator pitch of who, who are you? You know, a lot of the questions that I've, re that I've been asked are, tell me about your home network. And that's not just because they want to know. I mean, they're looking for specific answers because, most technical people have uh, ridiculous networks, especially when you're in the cyber field, right? Or, or you know, the worst interview I was ever in was with, with the military, and it was one question. Uh, explain cybersecurity at a macro level and dive down, and as you go deeper in, into it, we'll ask you questions. I mean, and this was a 90-minute interview to where, you know, if you're not confident in what you know, you're never going to survive. Because I think four of the guys had OSCP and two of them were CEOs outside of the Air Force. And you have to be able to talk. So, you know, be a champion for yourself. You're the only one that can be that champion for you. Nobody can be in the room with you. Uh, but that goes, you know, whether it's in person or it's a phone interview, be confident. Uh, you know, I know one of the things that I'm still trying to put together is executive presence. It is absolutely real. You know, I, I may not have it right now at almost midnight, but when when you talk on the phone, if it helps you on a phone interview to stand up just so that you kind of have that nice big chest, big breath, and you kind of, you know, I talk with my hands. Even when I'm on a phone interview, I'm standing up walking around my office like I'm on some sort of like Wall Street sales call. Uh, but that's just how I talk. and That's how I do things. And, and if it's in person, you know, practice those briefing techniques. Look at everybody around the room. Make eye contact. Steady your breathing and kind of slowly pace yourself through the room so that you're addressing each person. Uh, I mean, all of these things sound so ridiculous and so silly, but they are absolutely uh, key and making people believe. Because if you believe in yourself, I'm going to believe in you because that's what I want on my team. And, and when you do interviews, when I do interviews, it's kind of like the way I talk now, right? A lot of people at work think that, I, that I'm angry or I'm upset, but uh, unfortunately, I'm just kind of a loud, passionate talker. That's just how I do things. and. If you're excited, people are excited and you got it. And we're here to help you practice it. We really are. Yeah. You know, it's interesting to me too, Mark. I know when we you talk to technical people, uh, oftentimes we get the, well, that's ridiculous. I shouldn't have to do that. I'm a technical person. And, you know, I found uh, that it helps if we can spin it in a more cyber context, right? Um, so you're just socially engineer. You're just social engineering your way into a job. You're just hacking humans to get the job. And so however you need to view it, whatever you need to do, the reality is, it's a human being at that point that you're talking with and you've got to communicate confidence and ability and value to them for them to want to bring you on. Uh, and if you don't do that for whatever reason, uh, uh, talk to a close friend of mine, a super sharp lady uh, involved here at Cyberary and you know, kind of ask her what her pointers were. And one of the ones that she said that I thought was particularly interesting was if you are a fidgeter, just generally a fidgety person, don't wear rings or jewelry or watches or things that you're going to be sitting there in the interview fidgeting with the entire time because it's distracting because it can, it can communicate that you're uneasy or you're uncertain or that you're making things up as you go. And, you know, it, that may just be your personality and who you are, but you, 
you don't want to let that get in the way of, of, of landing the job. Hey, Mark, do we want to go you know, a little bit? I, I like that the group is leading the discussion, but I don't want to go off the rails too much, but we got a question about uh, uh, cybersecurity degrees, particularly if somebody has a, a, a liberal so, arts degree already. Um, and that's, well, sorry. I don't take that wrong. I don't want to offend anybody. Um, Mark obviously has his master's. I'm going for my master's right now. So uh, we definitely see the value in that. But yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you and I, you, you, Ken and I have had the conversation, right? Of do I go for the cybersecurity bachelor's, master's? Uh, my personal opinion is that I think they're uh, degrees that are only for sales numbers. Uh, but the way that I view it is if you go and you get an engineering degree or you get a computer science degree, you can do everything in IT, whether it's cyber or whatever. Uh, where if you get a cybersecurity degree, you know, you bypass a lot of the hard math stuff, you bypass a lot of the things, so you get a degree. Uh, and, and that's fine. At the end of the day, I mean, if you can, if you can jump on an interview and be confident and be a rock star and, and own it, then that's fine. It's just, I, I think overall, if you kind of get through a, a computer science or engineering degree, you're, you're better off because you learn a lot about how to think. I mean, I've, I haven't done, done anything really with computer science once I've graduated because I kind of just progressed into this wherever I'm at now. But, you know, I use those skills way more than I think. I mean, Will and I have talked about that a hundred times is, uh, you know, man, I, you know, I learned all this stuff. I don't really know how it applies to anything. And then somebody asks you a question and you realize, holy crap, I know all kinds of stuff about weird things. And, you know, I can quote Dykstra and the go-to and I've done COBOL and I've done all this crazy stuff and the exposure is good, you know, where, where, you know, you do a cyber degree and they really just kind of pinpoint you on whatever they think the word cyber means. And that's really just kind of a buzzword for today, right? It covers a specific kind of thing. And that's one of the things we deal with a lot in cyber is, well, I want a job in cyber. You know, that's fine, but I'm going to need you to tell me more. Do you want to do pen testing, SOC analyst, offensive, defensive, and the middle, both network engineering? I mean, what's your definition of cyber so I can help you figure out how to get where you want to go? Yeah, I mean, I, I know for myself, so it, it, degrees are an interesting point. Uh, I, I think the pretty general thing I can safely say is that if you're wanting to move up into management, particularly at large organizations, uh, a master's degree is absolutely helpful. Does it really matter what it's in? Not so much. Um, I, I think Mark's spot on. If you have a, a master's or a degree in computer science, that opens a lot of doors. Uh, if you have a master's or an undergrad in cyber, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it, it does, you don't have as many options there. Uh, and they take time and they take money, as do certs and everything else. So I think the one caution I would give to anybody on the call as they're pursuing education is if you, especially if you get that master's and you go in and you, again, cannot communicate what you know, you have done yourself a huge disservice because they've just dismissed the degree that you have and all of a sudden counts for nothing. Same thing with certifications. Um, the other challenging thing is, uh, I, I know a number of people and talk to them on a fairly regular basis that uh, they went, did their undergrad in cyber, they immediately rolled and did their master's in cyber and they've never worked in the field a day in their life. And when they get asked, tell me about your home network, they go, well, I, I, don't, I don't know, it's just you know from my internet service provider, it's whatever they gave. Uh, that doesn't communicate passion, that doesn't communicate understanding, and you've got no experience, and that's a really rough situation to be in. So I think education and degrees and certifications are one component. Um, experience is another really important component. Uh, so I guess it's three, right? So there's certifications, experience, and education. Uh, they all add value, uh, but none of them are great by themselves. Yeah, I mean, and it comes into, you know, I've interviewed people that are technically geniuses, but I've picked people that are about half the experience and technical, but they're willing to learn, they're super excited, and you can just tell that they're a good fit. So, I mean, being the most technical proficient person isn't always the best thing to be either. You have to know to communicate. And that's one of the things that, that I really try to work with cyber is the, the speaking and briefing techniques and the soft skills. Uh, certifications are great. But if you have a cert on your resume, you better be able to answer questions about it. Because if you're going down this path where I'm not really confident what you're telling me, and I know about those certs, I'm going to start asking questions. Uh, I, I've been in the game a long time. Will's been in the game a long time. 
I know that when you take these boot camps, a lot of them now give you the test dump because at the end of the day, that makes them get their five-star review. Uh, just don't be, I mean, it's fine if you, you read through that, but at the end of the day, you, you have to learn what the cert's all about because a certification is only as valuable as the information you learn from it. Because so it, you, you will get called out eventually. If you have all these certs and they hire you, they're gonna find out. Uh, I mean, you know, we, on cyber, I've seen plenty of people that pay and they join because they got a new job and they fluffed their resume and they BS'd it. And uh, they get mad at me for not being able to teach them how to do advanced Cisco networking in uh, a week because their new job starts. Just don't be that person. Just be honest to yourself when you apply for something. And if they ask you a question you don't know, it's perfectly fine to say, I don't know. And then what I always go into is this is how I would find it. Yeah, I agree. So a, a couple of times, this one's come up a couple of times and we'll circle, we're circling back around to it now, but it's, um, so for those on the call that are light on experience and wanting to leverage their cybrary uh, studies, how, how do they do that on a resume and or I would say through the interview and on all the way through to, to landing a job? Because I know, Mark, we've had a number of, a number, I can think of probably five off the top of my head of pretty great success stories of folks that have absolutely done that. So what's your take on that? Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I agree. It's, it's yeah. kind of one of the things that we deal with. I mean, yeah, I think, I think my internet froze up a bit there. Yeah, no, no, you're fine. So um, I'll jump in and fill gap here. Um, I think Mark kind of alluded to this earlier, any experience that you put on your resume, just be prepared to answer legitimate questions about it. So if you've done a vulnerability assessment course here on the platform and the a lab that's associated with it, and you know how to use Greenbone and OpenBoss, that's great, put that on there. Um, every resume I've ever seen has a skills and abilities section, put that on there, put that as a skill that you have. Um, now, and be prepared for questions and be prepared to answer honestly. Uh, I, I think the trick is, again, you'll, I think you'll hear a theme in the discussion tonight is that um, just going through the lab, just watching the video content is not the, the, the measure of success, right? Particularly in an interview. If you've put on your resume that you've done vulnerability assessment, be able to talk about that be able to talk about why that's important, be able to talk about the tool that you used. You might do some more research on OpenBoss and GreenBone and be able to talk to the fact that it's open source and that it's actually a component of a number of other uh, vulnerability assessment tools. Uh, know that Nessus and Qualys and some of the other vulnerability assessment tools exist. Um, do your research, be prepared to answer intelligently about anything you put on your resume. And I encourage people that if you've done it here on Cybrary, Add it into your skills and abilities, but be prepared to answer questions about it. Yeah, and Stella, if you have GitHub and you work on open source projects, put a link to your GitHub on the resume. You don't need to go into all that stuff because they can click on it and find out. Uh, if you blog, put that on there. Like Will said, you know, for, for me, it's different because I can't really do a lot of that stuff just because with, of what I do. But uh, that, that is one of the things I see all the time that people recommend. And, you know, when you go into, you know, with what Will was saying, so we've got the, the vulnerability assessment, you know, your next question is going to be, you know, hey, you got this report and here's all the, here's all of the items. You know, how do you recommend it to the boss? And so right there, they're tying in your communication skills, because if you're doing cyber at some level, somebody's going to come ask you a question, you're going to have to present something. And that's why we try to really focus on building those soft skills, because that's such a huge part of the job. And that's the biggest weakness that I see across the, the spectrum for most technical people. You know, I did a master's in computer science. I was the weird guy that I love talking in front of people. I was the strange one. I was always picked as the team lead because that's the easy thing is to get the guy that likes doing it to do it, right? But when you join cyber and you come to me, I'm going to challenge you to message me and you can jump on my Sunday calls and you can do a 10 minute presentation or you can just tell me and we'll set a, a conversation up and let's have you do a presentation and we'll go through it and we'll answer all those difficult questions. And if you say us and ums a thousand times, let's discuss it and then let's come back the next week and make it better. 
And, you know, Raphael, I saw your comment earlier, right, about when you get excited, you talk fast. Uh, I do the same thing. So, so when it's an official presentation, like especially for work uh, with me, I really kind of in my head just kind of take a breath and I speak. And I use my hands to kind of also pace myself as I go through things. Mm -hmm. And it, it really does help. And practicing and knowing, your, knowing the content uh, makes it a lot easier. Yeah, you know, if you're doing a presentation and presenting, um, again, I, people don't love to do this, but record yourself and then make yourself watch it. <laughs> yeah, you're, I mean, I recorded I record the about, videos. About your, how critical you are of your own feedback, right? But if you don't, you're, you're, leaving, you're leaving information on the table that you could take care of yourself. Yeah, I mean, I recorded the orientation videos, right? And it's 17 minutes of video that took me about eight hours because... Oh crap, I don't like that. I didn't say that right. And it's just the way it is. And you, you learn a ton from it. Uh, you know, it, it is a bit hard to watch yourself and listen to yourself talk, but it helps. And, you know, practice your, your elevator speech, practice answering questions. I mean, you can Google any type of job, any type of interview, and that's most of the questions you're going to be asked. Yeah, and and honestly, it's personality stuff. Sorry, I cut you off there, Mark. That's a no, great point. I am. Um, a lot of people here in the community ask about interview questions, and I find that's a hard one to do, right? Because outside of the generic, tell me about yourself kind of questions, um, it just depends so much on the organization, the tools that they use, what their organizational goals are. Uh, so it can sometimes be a challenge to help with that outside of more generic things, right? So I can ask you a bunch of generic cybersecurity questions just to make sure you can answer them. Uh, and there's some value in that, right? Again, in those soft skills and in the practice. Um, but I, I find that if you really understand the organization and you understand the role and you understand cybersecurity space in the business, you already really know what questions they're going to be asking, right? You've got the job description, you know what they do, you understand cybersecurity's context and what its ultimate mission is. You really should know what they're already going to be asking. And if you don't, don't feel bad. I think that Mark comes, you know, with a number of years experience doing this. Uh, here in the community, we can absolutely help you with that. But uh, encourage everybody to take the time, research the company, research the role, and really understand it beyond a bunch of bullet points that are on a job description. Um, you know, Stella, your, your yeah. points on open source projects to kind of changing gears, I, I think are absolutely great. What, to me, what uh, Bug Crowd, Hacker 101, Over the Wire, any of those types of things that you can tell me that you've done, your GitHub page, uh, an active LinkedIn profile where you're uh, creating content, especially, or cross-posting content, that just communicates to me that you're really passionate about the space, you're really interested in the job. Um, and when I stack that up against somebody that just has a couple certifications and none of the rest of that, um, you're the one I want to hire. You're the one that's going to get farther in the interview process because you're doing all those things. Again, is it necessary? No. But is it going to help? I think absolutely it is. Yeah. I mean, how many, how many people have you worked with, right, that they can come in and they can do the job, but w when you need somebody, you need somebody to count on. You know, for me, I know in my experience, I seem to be the only one that ever goes that extra mile or fills the gray area, right? And, and I have to say, Will, like, you know, you're the same way. And I have to think that that has something to do with why we're where we're at. Oh, yeah. And one of the biggest the, things I try to interview for is somebody's troubleshooting ability. And, and I don't mean that just from a strictly IT point, but um, if you have a bunch of information that's coming in at you all at once, what are you going to do with that? Because that's the real world, right, Mark? I mean, you're working right. in the C-cert and it is coming apart. You know, the SIM is blowing up. Um, the, the manager's at the door wanting to know why everything is red on monitoring. Um, what are you going to do? And some people sincerely just clam up. And, and that's right. not what I want. I want somebody that can look around, that has some situational awareness, that knows the organization and can go, it's this system over here. I've seen it before. I know why it is and can resolve the issue in the moment. Um, and right, you see that and you're like, okay. shows in an interview. Yep. 100%. And you see that and you're like, hey, look, okay, I know the guy that runs this here. Well, I'll get a hold of him. I'll get a hold of him. I'll get a hold of him. We'll put this all together. Give me 30 minutes. I'll bring a report to you and we'll go over it and we'll come up with a resolution. That doesn't mean it has to be fixed and you know everything that's wrong. But again, soft skills communication, 
uh, for me, I have lots of higher ups and stars and colonels that come yell and scream at you curse because that's just the military way about, you know, why is all my stuff broken? And they're yelling and screaming. And, you know, you've got to be confident enough in what you do to be able to tell somebody, hey, I'm on it. I know what's going on. This is what I see. This is what I know. Here's the history on this. This is what we've done in the past. And then give them a time frame of what we're going to produce. And if you give them that answer and then you call them back, you're fine. And I mean, you know, I know this is a little bit more than on an interview, but, you know, these are the things that you, it could come up in an interview question, right? Is, hey, give me a stressful situation you've been a part of and how you resolved it and practice that stuff. Like, you know, understand. That, that, that for me, that's one of the biggest questions I'm looking for. And it's like Will said, I want passionate people to work for me because that's how I am. And just for people, you know, there's a lot of people who joined cyber because they heard cyber is this six figure career field and you make lots of money. Uh, I saw the questions in here, you know, you can work from home, you can work remote. I, I'm sure that is true, especially now with the COVID-19 thing. For me, it's not applicable because you just can't do my job from home. But I'm also just, you know, don't come into this thinking like, oh, I'm going to get this work from home job and make a ton of money. Cyber is one of the fields where if you're truly not passionate about it, there's only so far you can go. You have to learn all the time. You have to do the courses. You have to do the learning. You have to love it. Uh, especially when you come into pen testing, reverse engineering malware analysis, that's a ridiculous field that if you're not truly passionate about it and you don't have a lab at home that you're building and trying to break stuff and join in, capture the flags and doing all these various things and open source projects. I mean, you'd probably be okay on a red team uh, for a job, but I mean, don't expect to jump in much past that because it's, it's a lot more than that. But, you know, for, for me, I believe that if you're going to do something, give it 180,000%. I mean, knock it out of the park. Uh, I don't sleep very often. So, you know, I'm doing my second master's and I probably shouldn't have taken that on on top of cyber and my job and everything else. But uh, if you have a goal with where you want to go, you got to do everything in your power to get there. And I, I know this sounds like a motivational speech, but it kind of is. But I mean, that, that's kind of what interviews are all about at the end of the day. I, I mean, one of the things we talked on, like with the interview philosophy, that was one of the big things that I believe in. And when I mentor people and talk to people, it's, you know, speaking confidently is not being arrogant. It's not being cocky. And even if it is, I mean, your interview, that's the only, that's the chance you get. You only get one. And if you make it to the second one, be even more proud of where you're at and be ready. Yeah. So I think Mark, we're coming up on the top of the hour, but um, just kind of to, to recap a little bit. And again, if anybody has any questions, definitely drop them in. It's been really fun. I, I know we've deviated from our original agenda quite a lot, uh, but because all the questions were there and were great. Um, so I, I think f for me, kind of Mark, to sum up, uh, yeah, your resume is absolutely important. It's the way you get in the door. You've definitely got to be prepared to have that resume get you both past a human and past the ATS system. Those can be really challenging things to do in a couple of pages in a presentable way. I mean, those are a lot of constraints there. So don't hesitate to invest in yourself and in your career. Uh, and find a good professional to help you get through those things. Um, but know that that professional is not going to be able to help you very much if you expect them to write your resume, their, your resume for you. Um, they need a, a log. They need you to be able to tell them what you've done and what uh, value you've added uh, so that you can flesh out that resume. But be prepared, have a good resume, have the raw materials to get that done. Um, and then, you know, Past that, be ready for that interview. And, and I think if, if everybody only walks away with one thing from this, for me, I think it's that have a fundamental understanding of what the interview is about. Why, why are we interviewing at all? And, and the point is, you know, I guess pointedly to an employer has a role that they need to fill. But that's, that's a pretty shallow view of it. And in and, and my opinion, Mark, I, I think that employer needs to find the best person they can that fits the team the best for the pay that they're willing to offer that's going to add the most value for the company. So you have to be able to communicate how you're going to add value in that interview, which means you have to come with the skills, both soft and hard skills, and you have to be able to communicate that. So 
like Mark said, when you get to that interview, they're already interested. You've got to continue to tell them that they've made the right choice and that you're going to add value for the company on day one. And if you're not honest, they'll know it and you'll be done. But if you are honest and you can tell them what your process would be to solve the problem, um, process and communication are so, so key because in our space, um, I don't think you're going to find anybody that knows it all. But what I need as an employer is somebody that's going to be able to get the job done that's put in front of them. Um, and I think that gets us down then through the interview. Uh, and maybe that's it, right, Mark? I mean, certifications and education, and I think all those things are hugely important. Um, you got to see where they fit for you based on your timelines and your goals and what you want to accomplish. Um, but I think that's really the, the heart of it for me. What did I miss, Mark? What, get me back in line. I, I'm, I'm sure I'm off the reservation somewhere. No, I, I, think, I think you hit it all. Uh, I mean, you always do. But I mean, I think the, the big difference, right, is that we all have technical skills. We've all done all these great things technically. In my mind, the separator is communication skills and soft skills and speaking and briefing and communicating all of this stuff that you've done correctly. And that's one of the things that I, that I really harp on with, with the people I work with is you spent all this money and all this time and the degrees and certs and all of this stuff and you put zero effort in your communication skills you know, you're only killing yourself when it comes to this kind of stuff. And in the way that I see it with me, that that's the only big difference I have is that I can talk. I'm not the most technical person by any means. Uh, I'm super stubborn and I can get any job done and I'm confident when I speak. And if you hire me, I know I can get there. And, you know, let Will and I help you get to, to that point, right? It's, you know, technically, technically, I think we are, we're all capable of doing whatever ever we need to do. Uh, but that, that's what it is when it comes to interviewing. It's, uh, yeah, Mike, you're right. I mean, it, it is a balance, right? And obviously when it comes to soft skills, more some people are better at it than others. But all that really means is they practice more. Uh, I, I Trust me, when I do big speeches out here or briefs for these conferences, I promise you before I walk out on that stage, I am nervous every single time. And you just have to learn to channel that and push it aside and, uh, really go at it. And, you know, the more you know about a topic and the more prepared you are, the less nervousness comes through. But if you look up any book or read any book on briefing techniques or speaking or presentations, nervousness is good. I mean, you have to have that. Otherwise, you're a robot and you give the speeches that nobody wants to listen to. But, you know, we'll cover everything that I would want to talk about on an interview. Uh, I think I learned stuff from this session, which is always awesome. Yep, all the questions were definitely great. Sam, I'm gonna unmute you here and see if you have any wrap up for us, sir.